It's great to welcome to the program today David Roberts, who's a journalist for Vox, focusing on climate change and politics. And we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. David, great to have you on today. Glad to be here. So a lot of the folks in my audience have been in a concerned manner following what seems to be the sort of the irrelevance of the truth, as it may be in modern politics, whether it's alternative facts, whether it's there's nothing Donald Trump could ever do, even hypothetically, that would make me reconsider my support for, for him, which we heard is the case for 62 percent of uh, Trump supporters. Some are just calling this a post truth status quo in which we find ourselves. But is is that encompassing enough? How do you describe what you see today is the relationship between the sort of political world and the truth as it is knowable. Sure. Well, that's a that's a that's a lot. (laughs) That's complicated. But I guess the way I would put it is that um, in any sort of society or culture, there is a bedrock of trust. What 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 they call social trust, political scientists call social trust which is just a sense that we're we're in this together that we're part of we're, that we're part of a larger project together and that whatever sacrifices we make for that project whatever restraints we put on ourselves or whatever um you know we have to do we get back from that project at, at, you know we get food shelter uh, uh social belonging so social trust is sort of the basis uh it, it turns out for everything for politics working um, and it turns out even to be the basis of uh, uh, our information system. So uh, what we've seen happen in the last several decades is uh, a, a sort of erosion of social trust in the U.S. Um, I have my own thoughts about who, what, who and what were the primary cause of that. But the result is that the institution of media, the institution of journalism, uh, as it existed in post-war America, no longer commands widespread social trust. There, there is a large faction of the country, 30, 40 percent, no one I think knows exactly how large, that simply does not accept what, uh, uh, ma- what mainstream journalists, journalism tells it anymore and has now, um, you know, the, 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 the conservative movement lost trust in mainstream media, separated from it, more or less went off and made its own kind of funhouse mirror version of journalism, but but it, it forgot to replicate what made journalism uh, work, which is some element of self-correction, some sense that journalists are devoted to principles beyond party, beyond faction, that they're sort of answerable to higher principles of, of evidence and, you know, uh, getting a, a second quote, all these sort of day-to-day rules of journalism are meant to sort of guard against uh, tribalism, guard against sort of like just telling a story that's whatever your audience wants to hear. Uh, when the conservative movement sort of made its own media, it, it, it dropped that part out. And now we have what is effectively a second competing media that is devoted just to telling that audience what it wants to hear, not being answerable to any principle above partisanship or above uh, faction. So, so we have effectively become as a, as a people incapable of knowing things together, which turns out to be, really important to democracy, really important to doing anything together. The first step is knowing things together. And we've become unable. We now have a sort of a conservative media apparatus that if it sets out to, can shield this 30 to 40 percent of the country from any information it wants. It doesn't matter how clear the information, it doesn't matter, you know, sort of uh, and, and I wrote the article about impeachment, which seems to me sort of a kind of the perfect example of this. I mean, the Trump administration cranks out an example of this every every day you could point to. But impeachment seems to me a, a, a poignant example in that the story about what Trump did selling, you know, withholding aid to Ukraine in exchange for an, an uh, investigation of of Biden is just really clear now. It's just really obvious. We've had multiple uh, multiple direct 
testimony, accounts. Trump has admitted it <laughs> multiple times before he figured out he wasn't supposed to have done it. Multiple administration officials have admitted to it. It's got documentary evidence. There's a, there's a log of the call on and on and on. There's just this overwhelming pile of information. It's just very obvious what he did and why he did it. And yet, as obvious as it is, there's 30 to 40 percent of the country that doesn't know it, that believes all sorts of weird cockamamie other things about a giant deep deep state conspiracy and a you know a, a server in Ukraine and I don't even know all the all the conspiracy theories that are going on right now. But but the point is we've become incapable of learning and knowing things together. So it's not that truth is gone. Truth is out there, as they say. It's not the it's not the nature of truth that's the problem. It is a social process whereby we learn and accept and act on that truth. That's what's broken. One of the things that seems to have helped some of these almost meme type narratives take hold, like, for example, fake news, is that there's some kernel of sense in the idea, for example, that, hey, we shouldn't just accept what media tell us. OK, great. That there's, there's a kernel of truth there. Sometimes opinion and reporting are blurred to your disadvantage. Absolutely. Right. I mean, that's how that's that's a, 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 a important part of what Fox News does. We should uh, sometimes uh, media gets it wrong and so on. But then it becomes if it sounds like it's critical of Trump, it must be untrue without requiring more examination. And I think that's why it's so pernicious, because it starts with a kernel of responsibility or truth and then goes completely off the rails. Yeah, no, I think that's totally right. And, and I think if you go back and look at post-war journalism in the U.S., you know, the conservative movement's critique was always that this journalist class, especially as, as the decades went on, is sort of composed of people who come from the liberal class. They're socially liberal. They're basically, you know, they believe in tolerance. They're, <clears throat> you know, moderates, whatever. And that sometimes shades news coverage in a way where conservatives felt like people of their persuasion were not getting a voice. There was always a kernel of truth to that. But the question is, what do you do with that? If, 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 the, if the problem is media bias that sometimes ends up telling us uh, that, it, that it ends up going against us, what's the solution? You could go two directions. You could go, let's redouble our, the, the, the rules and principles that we use to guide journalism. Let's redouble our commitment to fairness. Let's redouble our commitment to hearing all voices and balancing all voices, right? Or you could go the other way. Here's a biased news source that's telling us that's going against us. Let's create a news source that tells us what we want to hear, right? It, it, so the problem that they identified, if you look at what, uh, if you look at how they reacted, right? They didn't react by going and creating media with better guards against bias, right? Against or better guards against unfairness. They went and created media that dispensed with all guards against fairness and just told conservatives what they wanted to hear, right? So it sounded, looking back on it, it sounds to me like it wasn't the bias that was the problem. It was that the bias went in the wrong direction for them, right? Like if you look at CNN and your complaint is that it's not objective enough and then you go create Fox, right? Maybe it wasn't the, the objectivity that was really the, the root of your objection, right? More the root of their objection is just that we're not hearing what we want. Like, like <laughs> the results, what we're hearing go, go against us. So we need, you know, we're not going to change our, our persuasion or what we want or our goals. We're going to go find a media that will tell us what we want. I want to get your take on the degree to which you think education is is a is a factor here. And I'll give you an example that might be a good lens into it. So the Trump tax reform plan passed a couple years ago. And one of the things that it did is not only did it change tax rates, but it also changed the default withholding tables, meaning that when you fill out your W-4 for your employer, you put I have one dependent. The default amount of tax that was withheld during the year changed. And you very quickly had a lot of people saying the tax cuts worked. I've got more money in my <laughs> paycheck. And then at the end of the year, you might have had someone who had one hundred dollars more in their paycheck per month. 
but their tax return sure. was fifteen hundred dollars short. So in reality, they lost three hundred dollars net. I have I have argued that if we start teaching critical thinking, basic financial skills, epistemology early, like I say at age 12 in seventh grade, that a lot of those very base talking points that are effective in politics would be far less effective. Uh, am I overstating the importance of the education piece or or do you yeah, think that there's something there? This is a really interesting question. It goes way back and I've been I've gone back and forth on this. I have I have come down not on the other side. Obviously, teaching young people to think critically is a great thing. I mean, I mean, I don't know that anybody would be against it. I do think it's a, a fantastic idea, and I do think, especially in today's you know media and information environment, it's just a jungle. So, absolutely, people need to be better equipped to, to navigate it. But I ultimately don't think that we're ever going to get to a place where we have created a kind of uh, like a super soldiers <laughs> who become, you know, immune to this stuff or, or, or can't be fooled by this stuff. Ultimately, I think relying on individuals to navigate this it is, is fruitless because all individuals ultimately, no matter how good of skeptical thinkers they are, everyone's subject to these kind of biases and these kind of cognitive flaws. Everybody wants to be told what they want to hear like that's not a that's not unique to any particular kind of person everyone sort of especially if you're just in sort of like the the rush of your day-to-day -day life you're just not gonna like hone in and analyze on every single thing that comes out of the the, the tv you know to sort of assess it yourself you just don't have this sort of kind of cognitive energy or time so so to me ultimately the solutions got to be in our institutions we've got to build self-correction and self-checking into the institutional rules. So for instance, I, I, I think of science, you know, and, and I don't know if you've ever met scientists, they're not superhumans. They're not, un, you know, they're, they're just normal people. They have in their day-to-day -day life, they have all the same cognitive biases we have. They're not super reasoners. But what they've got a framework what, to work through some exactly. of the, right? So it's, it's, yeah, it's like a bigger infrastructure, right? Of science. They have the rules. It's like, guild it's like a guild almost there's guild rules you have to your paper has to be peer reviewed like everyone the whole point of the exercise is for everyone to constantly be questioning everybody else if you did that in normal life you'd be a jerk right but in science there are these rules that's how we do things and so what makes it work is collectively right it's not that any individual scientist is a superhero it's that collectively by correcting one another and checking one another you can help eliminate some of those biases and blind spots and sort of grope your way towards the truth. And it's the same for journalism or sort of name your institution. It's it's important to have good institutions and rules and self-correction mechanisms built into your institutions because if that breaks down, ultimately everybody's just going to retreat to their tribal corners, right? You're not going to, they're not going to reason their way through it. They're just going to find a tribe that they feel safe with and say, I'm going to believe what these people believe, right? I mean, people feel anxious with uncertainty. They feel anxious when there's no trusted source of information and they go looking for comfort. And that's what kind of this sort of tribalism is that, that we're seeing so much today. Once you lose these trust in these institutions, it kind of becomes everybody for themselves. When you look at the antidote, so to speak, you're, you're sort of alluding to it here by saying that there has to be some system that doesn't depend on any one person having the sort of uh, determination to handle it themselves or to think through it th themselves. Can you give us in the limited time we have left just a couple examples of what that might look like? Well, j just take just take journalism and <clears throat> the rules of journalism. I mean, as, as you learn them, like you can't just trust one quote, you need a second quote to back up your first quote because the, the first quote um, might be uh, uh, flawed in some way or it might have just, you found a quote that told you what you wanted to hear and it might be the exception. If you go talk to other people, you might find other things. Just little rules like that. Little rules like 
if you find an error in your in your story, you publicly publish a correction, even though it's embarrassing to you and maybe the institution. It's part of the rules that we are transparent when we get things wrong. Just little bits and pieces like that, little rule guild rules. People see those in operation and it gives them comfort that there's like the structures in place that I can trust what comes out of this institution. And so I really think we need to be doing two things right now. One is improving the institutions, right? Like there was a reason, there are good reasons people have lost trust in our institutions. I think, uh, you know, this sense that kind of they're rigged for the benefit of the powerful, et cetera, et cetera. I think all that stuff is, is valid. So I think we need to refocus on rule of rule of law, not of people, right? in democracy and in, 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 in institutions to make those rules. And we need to find some way of, of reaching that 30 to 40% of people who have sort of hived off from mainstream society and, and bring them somehow back into the fold. Because I just don't see how democracy survives if we all know different things, if we're all effectively living in different worlds. I just don't think democracy can can stumble on very long in that condition. That is uh, that is that is the great fear and the great concern. We've been speaking with David Roberts, who's a journalist for Vox, focusing on climate change and politics. Check out his work. We'll be linking to some of it. David, so great having you on. I really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, David.